Modding has always been an integral part of the Minecraft experience, but mods that attempt to emulate vanilla's own style of content have only recently become popular. Starting with 1.13, the recent ambitious updates have provided a model for other developers to follow, giving rise to a new definition of vanilla plus modding. Apart from mods like Quark, previous Vanilla Plus mods often imitated vanilla content to a T, adding bland ores and tall tiers. Suggestions for Mojang about the vanilla game are often even smaller, such as gameplay polishes and tweaks, or various obvious inclusions like the enchanting table storing lapis. While taking elements straight from the source might seem like a safe way to make a Vanilla Plus mod, it actually proves to be rather ineffective, since it produces features that are redundant with vanillas either by overshadowing it or adding very little to the base game. Mods are supposed to add content that creates new gameplay value, the same way that vanilla updates bring unique features. These may even feel modded at first, but the player base adjusts, and eventually can't imagine living without them. Mods can take the same approach. Of course, not every feature has to be new and game changing, and their mechanics can certainly be inspired by the base game. But to think of something completely new, a good place to start would be Minecraft's official design principles, or at least the ones we currently know of. To ensure the gameplay experience isn't compromised, Mojang adheres to specific design principles. We've been told some of them outright. For instance, Jeb wants poisonous potatoes to never have a purpose. Others we can glean from Minecraft's design trends, such as the loose fantasy vibe it gives off. High-tech stuff wouldn't fit in with this verbatim, but it could be themed after redstone and the end, as long as the functionality is simple and intuitive. The first official rule we learnt about was mentioned during Update Aquatic's snapshot cycle. When discussing why sharks didn't come in the update, Bedrock developer Tanner Pearson mentioned that hostile animals can't be based on real life. There are a few edge cases. Spiders are big enough to be considered fantasy, silverfish deviate significantly from their real world appearance, and goats do not immediately attack the player on site, making them technically neutral. Many neutral mobs can also be aggroed by things other than direct damage, like bees, polar bears, and dolphins are. These decisions tie into Mojang's greater attitude towards ecological and societal issues. They don't want to misrepresent animals, especially endangered ones, but giving real-life mobs unmistakably fantastical elements is permissible, such as turtle shells being a potion ingredient, dolphins increasing a player's swim speed, or cats scaring off creepers and phantoms. Additionally, since all mobs are genderless, and great care was taken to make the new villager textures inspired by Minecraft-based fashion instead of real-life cultures, we can assume that new features should also avoid association with such topics, especially points of contention. This year at Minecraft Live, Jeb showcased a book he had written about Minecraft game design. No one but Mojang developers have access to this book, but we were shown two pages, each having a design principle. The first is, one block at a time. The primary principle is that all actions interact with one block at a time. You break one block, pull one lever, and till one block of dirt. There should not be any copy-paste functionality, building templates, or similar convenience tools. Interacting with a block may impact multitudes of other blocks of course, such as planting a tree, blowing up a TNT, or activating a network of redstone, but from the player's perspective, it all starts with that singular interaction. Why is this important? It allows Mojang to maintain the interaction model of Minecraft, but it also sets an essential constraint to how you build things with other players. Jeb wants a player to understand what is happening when they see someone else play. Instantaneously placing buildings with templates would make it hard for an observer to assist. This design principle was also mentioned by Tanner much earlier, and was the source I used in my video on the cave update. To reiterate, this rules out 3x3 mining tools, tree fellers, and ore vein miners. It may seem like an arbitrary rule, but it's important, and quite fun to think of ways to work around, in my opinion. Instead of a tree feller, for example, logs created upon world generation, or grown from a sapling, could fall like sand and gravel, allowing you to chop a whole tree down one block at a time, but without moving your mouse, or having to pillar up to reach the top. This also prevents floating trees, while allowing the old log behavior if the block is mined and placed again similar to how player place leaves will not decay. The second rule mentioned is, bad things happen, but it's technically the player's fault. Disaster is common in Minecraft, be it falling in lava or having your house blown to pieces by a creeper. The point is that these accidents happened when there were players there to see them happen. 
Avoiding such dangers is done by playing differently and more carefully. The game should not create situations that are impossible to avoid, and when it does, they should have a reasonably small impact. Making sure the player is treated fairly is one reason why the worst natural disaster is a relatively tame lightning strike, and the list of blocks the endermen take is limited to natural and plentiful blocks such as dirt and stone. If a game mechanic is going to destroy hours of players' hard work, players should be the ones initiating it, and players should be able to stop or even prevent it entirely. One practical example is how iron golems ignore creepers, because otherwise the creeper would explode and destroy buildings without any player interaction. This one has been brought up many times over the years, often in response to adding natural disasters like tornadoes, floods, or volcanic eruptions, or mobs that significantly grief a world, such as breaking blocks to get to a player. Some believe that this principle rules out incentive to build better defences, if a couple blocks can stop all danger. But as I said in my video on more survival mechanics, flipping this on its head can allow for the same thing. The environment could affect mob behaviour instead of the other way round, such as mobs phasing through some blocks, climbing on ceilings, or jumping across large gaps. This would also encourage creative, functional building, without the need to constantly repair structures. Tying into this, we can be relatively sure that new blocks should almost always be breakable, since the only naturally occurring unbreakable blocks are bedrock, end portals, and their frames. And these are unbreakable for good reason. Bedrock serves as a physical boundary to the void or the roof of the nether, and also comprises permanent features such as the end crystal platforms, the exit portal, and end gateways. End portals and their frames create permanent access points to the end, so if those could be broken, the end could be irreversibly locked off. An alternative solution is to have endermen rarely spawn holding endstone, and allow end portal frames to be craftable, like from my video on quasi law. While this rule is not explicitly mentioned, comments from developers point out that unbreakable blocks being too common makes it harder for the player to shape the environment. It also makes structure design more interesting. Ocean monuments have elder guardians that give mining fatigue. The challenge in bastions comes from their state of disrepair, and nether fortresses have long corridors that are easier to travel through than mining. Of course, mining through these isn't impossible, but this is a good thing, as it allows for new creative ways for players to conquer structures. It also inspires new structure design ideas. A building with boomstone, which explodes when mined, explained in my cave update video. Observers detecting when the walls are broken and unleashing mobs, or lava hidden in the walls, are just a few ways to encourage exploring a structure as intended, without completely ruling mining out. These design principles were likely developed around the time of Microsoft's acquisition of Mojang, just after the release of 1.8, since rabbits were the last real-life mob to have useful drops upon death. This means the rules were likely retroactively designed to accommodate would-be exceptions, since creepers, ghasts, endermen, and lightning were all added relatively early in development, and come close to breaking the no unavoidable destruction rule. Lightning rods are being introduced in the Caves and Cliffs update to redirect lightning away from flammable blocks, but the creeper is simply too iconic for the vanilla game to change. It was one of the few textures that Jappa didn't touch. Its explosion doesn't drop all blocks like TNT now does, its Minecraft Dungeons texture was merely toned down, and the Creeping Winter DLC was going to introduce blue creepers before the green was deemed too iconic. This leads us to an interesting point. If the creeper was added today, would it be considered a vanilla style feature? Would it act differently? After all, its destructive nature makes it antithetical to the sandbox of Minecraft. There are likely many other legacy features that would have been implemented differently if they were added in modern versions. But changing any feature can invite backlash. Players might have incorporated old mechanics into their playstyle, or simply consider legacy content as classic or nostalgic and even trivial changes can be risky. I'm looking at you, zombified piglin! However, mods can get away with changing vanilla, if the changes can be disabled. Perhaps then, the only way to make Minecraft more vanilla is to mod it. Update its legacy features to better fit modern versions, so that developers can experiment with changing the very fundamentals of vanilla. For that is, in many ways, unexplored territory.
Changing vanilla features isn't the only way to improve upon vanilla, however. You can also try giving them more purpose. One good example would be the campfire. In the Buzzy Bees update, its functionality wasn't changed, but the new beehives and bee nests required its smoke to pacify bees and allow honey to be safely harvested. This is how Corey Shiviak, another gameplay developer, put it in response to my question at Minecon last year. Yeah, so when, when you're kind of thinking of ideas, uh, when we think of ideas, we try to think first of, would this fit in with the original game? Does it add something to it? Mm -hmm. And then we think, does it work with other features that are already in the game? We really try to add things that will interact with the, the game loop and try to bring everything together. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're thinking of features to suggest, try to think about how does this interact with features that are already in the game? How would this uh, enhance them, for instance? Plenty of mods often neglect this note, and instead have their own systems that can make any existing vanilla solutions obsolete. Building a contraption in a tech mod is usually a lot simpler than making the same thing using redstone for example. Other modded content doesn't interact with vanilla at all, such as magic mods being completely independent of vanilla's magic. Not every mod has to interact with vanilla to be good, but a tech or magic mod aiming to be vanilla style should definitely fold vanilla mechanics into its design. The technical game meta is determined by emergent gameplay, which is where a few simple features come together to create something more complex than the sum of its parts. Since Minecraft is a sandbox, many different playstyles emerge from its mechanics. These are extremely hard for a designer to foresee and account for, but if the base components are designed well, it can lead to a lot of unique scenarios, such as Piglin and Hoglin interactions, as well as a lot of player creativity, such as a few simple redstone components making a calculator, or a system with a high skill ceiling, like 1.8 PvP strafing, block hitting, and W tapping strategies. Of course, this can come at the cost of intuitivity, so some of the more esoteric or unintended technical innovations could be simplified. For instance, a vanilla style tech mod could replace TNT duping with its own method for TNT production and transportation that are renewable and automatable. If you take one thing away from this video, let it be that vanilla style mods should aim to have content Mojang might add, instead of clones of pre-existing features. Striders one-upping obsidian boats, the Alatra surpassing simple gliders, and the savage bartering of piglins over pigmen villages are just some of the ways Mojang has developed a unique take on a popular but plain idea. And Mojang is only continuing to expand their vision, with complex additions such as the Warden and entirely new systems like Archaeology. These features don't feel vanilla at first, but this sentiment is largely subjective and arbitrary. Mojang doesn't need to let this constrain them, so we shouldn't either. As long as we add content to extend vanilla, instead of merely imitating it, and stick to their design principles, which are Ideas should fit with the fantasy theme of Minecraft Real life animals shouldn't be misrepresented or hostile And stereotypes, gender, and unbreakable blocks should be avoided Players can only change one block at a time And are the cause of all disaster in the world And most importantly Poisonous potatoes should never, ever be given a use So what do you think a vanilla style mod should be? Feel free to comment below. Do you disagree with anything I said? I welcome respectful criticism. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a like. And if you really like what we do, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Patrons and people who Nitro boost our Discord servers get access to beta builds of all of our mods, including unreleased ones. We also have a slew of existing vanilla style mods, which you can browse through on our website. I have some more quasi lore videos planned, and I've been blown away with the response the first one got. So if those interest you, subscribe and hit the bell, and soon they should be up for you to enjoy. Links to our other social media are in the description down below. Until next time, stay abnormal. Special thanks to Adele, Swuff, Finny, Stephanie, and the cult leader 666 for pledging $5, and Jubbalub, Connor, Ava, David, Catscythe, and Shatscythe for pledging $10. Thank you for all your support.